Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Artistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you'd like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode, Hope Bollinger joins me to discuss her new book, A Country of Their Own, being an acquisitions editor, and her modeling work. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Hope, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And I wanted to uh, start our conversation by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I started uh, pretty late into the game. I, you know, I kind of always suspected there was something growing up. I never really looked into it. And it was actually the way I kind of discovered it was really weird. I do a lot of writing and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit later on. And consistent feedback I would get on my books where people would ask me if my main character was on the spectrum. And they would kind of point out certain things about the characters. And I would be thinking, well, no, this is just how I think about things. Like, this is how I perceive the world. And so after about, like, the sixth character, like, main character, I got asked about this. I thought, okay, this is really interesting that I just consistently keep getting asked this question. So I decided to just do a deep dive. And so it kind of basically started right there. And from what I understand, you are a person of many talents. You're a, an acquisitions editor, a novelist, and a model, to uh, name a few. And I wanted to to learn uh, about your work as an acquisitions editor, because I don't think I've talked with anyone before in that role. So what exactly do you do? What are your responsibilities as an acquisitions editor? Yeah, for sure. So I work with a publishing company called Endgame Press. And to be honest with you, I didn't think I was going to be an acquisitions editor for several years. So it kind of ended up happening a lot sooner than I thought it was. And for anyone who doesn't know or isn't familiar with the world of publishing, what that essentially means is you are making a decision about which books your publishing house is taking on. Uh, And there's a lot of other responsibilities I have. I also edit every single book that comes through that we are taking on as a company. I'm also in charge of making sure that every single book stays on schedule. So every single book, once it gets taken on, has like 35 different steps. It has to go through. So I'm in charge of making sure that every single book hits every single one of those deadlines and gets to print on time. So there's a lot of different things in the role But the really cool thing about being an acquisitions editor is you're a decision maker. So you can kind of essentially decide what books are going to represent our company the best, what voices that aren't being heard right now can get heard when we take on certain books. And so that's the coolest part of the role, I think. Now, I just had mentioned a minute or two ago about you being a novelist, but I think that's very much underselling what you've done in in regards to writing as you've had 26 books and three plays published and have had more than 1,400 of your works featured in various publications. And that, you know, is very impressive, but it makes me think about executive functioning. What is your system or your process of completing all these literary works? No, this is a great question. A lot of it comes down to a lot of time management, but in terms of the books, because I think those are the ones that are going to be like the longest projects and the ones that require the most effort and energy. I have this whole process. Usually it starts with an idea and you kind of let it sit in your brain for a little bit of time. And so each idea has a little bit of a different percolation period. Sometimes it could be a couple of weeks. Sometimes it could be several years. And then you get to the point where you are excited to write about whatever book, or if you have a deadline, then you have to be excited about that book because you have a deadline. So I kind of go ham on the research portion. I love the research portion. I could spend forever on that portion. I will spend hundreds of hours researching whatever topic that specific book is covering. I write fiction, but you still have to research pretty much everything. So 
once I feel like I know enough about that area of research to be able to communicate it effectively to my audience, I will then compile a skeletonic outline. And so usually I kind of generally know what I want to happen in the book if I leave margin for error because my characters like to fight me. And then I get started on the writing. And I usually can write a book somewhere between my record so far is seven days. So usually it's somewhere between one to four weeks. I will have word count goals I hit every single day, let that first draft sit once I finish it, and then a couple months later come back to edit it. So I have everything down to a science. I even kind of know the pacing of certain word counts, like what needs to happen within 500 words, 1,000 words, 1,500. You kind of know the beats that you kind of have to hit. There's a really fun science to it that I've kind of cracked having written, you know, several dozen books at this point. I love hearing about how you don't start until you're inspired. So, and then you also were mentioning the deadline. So what usually comes first, the deadline or the inspiration? Well, it's funny because when I first got started in publishing, you would have to fight for every single book contract. So I did not have things contracted until the book was finished when I first got started. Now, being a couple of years into the business and with like 26 books under contract, what has happened is I have a number of publishers I've worked with frequently. So I will sometimes pitch them an idea and give them a synopsis. And if they are game for that idea and want to work with it, they will assign me a deadline. <laughs> so it used to be that I could just wait for inspiration to strike. Now I'm kind of having to force inspiration a little bit, sometimes depending on the book. There are some books I'm definitely very, very excited to write and have no problem diving into it. And there are some, like the one I'm writing right now, that you're kind of having to chase inspiration with a club. So it kind of depends on the arrangement. So at the beginning, when I got started, it used to be that you could kind of just write at your leisure and kind of take your time with it. But now it's a little different. So I'm kind of having to switch gears and get used to having multiple deadlines because last year I had seven book deadlines. And this one I have five thus far. We're working on book number four right now. But it's been a lot more hectic than I planned for, for sure. <laughs> so um, continuing to think about executive functioning, um, all of us procrastinate one thing or another in our lives. And I read that your favorite procrastination is encouraging and connecting with other writers. So what advice would you give fellow writers that may be listening to us right now to encourage them to, to write? No, this is, this is a good question because whenever I get asked this, there's so many pieces of advice I want to give. So I will boil it down to two pieces of advice. First is to trust the process. It's an arduous process. Publishing, I think, is a lot more difficult than most of us anticipate going into it. So know that there is a lot of rejection. There is a lot of stuff that can be difficult, but remember why you got started in the first place. Remember why you are so passionate about this story and keep at it. And my second piece of advice is to ask any published author their story. Because everyone has one and they will kind of tell you what their own publishing journey was like to try to get into the industry. So that way you can feel a little bit less alone. I wish when I jumped into the industry, I'd asked more people their stories because I think I would have felt camaraderie with people that we kind of all had gone through the same things, experienced the same rejections, and then cheered each other on when we experienced the same victories too. That's something I say a lot is about trusting the process and really honoring the process. So for me, a lot of that has to do with just kind of faith that things are going to work out. I'm, I'm curious how that works for you. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm the same way. And, you know, I come from like a religious background. So for me, a lot of it comes down to trusting that there is a plan that's in place, even when I don't know where stuff is going. <laughs> but also just seeing patterns too, and knowing that even when you experience rejection, it just takes one yes, just to kind of get there. And sometimes when doors close, I don't always see it as a rejection, but sometimes it's a, a dodge bullet. Sometimes it's a just a door that you were not supposed to go through. So I try to see things through that lens too, that even if something doesn't go through right now, something may in the future. So holding out for that. 
Now, as someone uh, approaching their mid 40s, I think about getting older uh, more and more these days. And with your recent book, A Country of Their Own, you tackle the topic of ageism. Can you tell us why you decided to write about this topic at this point in your life? Yes, and I'm going to try to keep this brief because this is like a passionate subject for me. So I experienced the opposite side of ageism in my industry. I'm in an industry where most people don't even debut their first book until they're in their 40s at the youngest end of the spectrum. I could tell you many, many, many stories about blatant ageism. And I knew I've heard many stories from other people who experienced it on the opposite end as well. And I just, I see the value in hearing from people of every single generation. I think every single generation is worth hearing. Everyone has different wisdom to bring to the table and different experiences. So I wanted a book that kind of tackled the idea of ageism that we are all wise beyond our years and young at heart and seeing what it would look like to come together and experience wisdom together. So, and there's not many books I know that kind of tackle the topic of ageism, so I thought, why not do it? That book definitely circles around those types of themes. I had mentioned briefly earlier that you're a model, and when people think about that modeling, there's a certain image or type of modeling work that pops up into uh, their minds. So you've done you know, lots of different types of modeling jobs, but modeling that maybe some types of jobs that maybe people wouldn't necessarily think of. So what are some types of unique photo shoots that you have done? Yeah, so in terms of modeling, I've been doing it for like three and a half years. I actually got started on runways and have been diving more into the photo shoot world uh, recently. So maybe the two types that people don't often think of that I have done is bridal and high fashion. So the bridal stuff is mostly on the runway, although I've done some shoots. And it's exactly what it sounds like you're in wedding dresses. And a lot of times people who come to these runways or look at the magazines that your photos are in, they're thinking about their wedding. They're thinking about what are they going to wear? What do they kind of want to see there? So that is really, really cool to kind of go down the runway or take pictures in different wedding dresses, especially I'm not married yet. So it's kind of a fun experience. And then the other type is high fashion. So think weird, think outrageous outfits and makeup and very, very dramatic types of poses and shots. And I personally have a lot of fun with that. I've been told I can do creepy shots really well. I've been told I'm the token creepy girl, which I'm fine with, but I like the dramatic stuff. I have a theater background. So I've done like, I participate in like 60 something plays. So anything out there or bizarre, I'm all for those types of shoots too. So those are the maybe more different types of shoots that people don't typically think of when they think of the world of modeling. Yeah, those looked a lot more interesting to me. I've already been married, so I don't really care about the bride, <laughs> and, that, bride and, and runway stuff. So, but yeah, it, it looks like it looks a lot more fun. Those types of shoots. They really are. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the ones that are like really sweet or boho or whatnot. I've been doing some of those <laughs> lately to our street wear or whatnot. It's fun kind of doing different stuff. I know I've also said that modeling kind of helps me get my acting fixed because theater stuff takes like eight weeks of commitment. And I love theater, but I don't love not being able to see friends and family for several weeks. So in modeling, you know, you get to capture a feeling or you get to capture an emotion. So the more dramatic ones are really, really fun. They're really dynamic. So I think I have the most fun with that type of stuff, but I'm always game for most types of genres of modeling. Now I've done about 250 episodes almost here on Autism Stories, and I've had the pleasure and privilege to speak to people all over the United States and around the world. However, I rarely get the opportunity to talk with people that live or have lived where I do, and that's in Cleveland in Northeast Ohio. So from what, what I understand, you're from Northeast Ohio. So I'm, I'm curious, what do you love about Northeast Ohio? What are some of the things that you've enjoyed doing here? Yeah, well, I can tell you I don't love the weather eight months out of the year, but <laughs> I love pretty much everything else. I love the falls here and I love spring here. I love that we have a million metro parks because I just, I love to hike. I love to get lost in those. I like that, you know, it's crowded enough where there's a lot of people and a lot of things to do, but it's small enough where you can get involved in so much. 
I love the people here. The people here are just very genuine and very sweet. And you get along with pretty much almost everyone you meet here. So, I mean, if you've never been to Ohio and you're listening, definitely pay a visit, especially in the October range, if you really want to see some really beautiful trees. But I've lived in Ohio most of my life, except for college. And I just absolutely love it here. So I guess those are some of the things I really like about Ohio. Yeah, for anyone that hasn't been to uh, the Cleveland area, particularly, there's some amazing, we call them the metro parks. There's there's some amazing reservations here to check out. Do you have a favorite one of, of the metro parks that you've been to? Oh, I don't know the name of it. I felt like I was in like Lord of the Rings when I walked through it. So I can't remember the name of one, but I can tell you one that I frequent that's a little bit closer to home called The Ledges. It's up in like the Cuyahoga Falls area, and it's almost sure. just as pretty as the one. But I mean, we have so many really good ones. There's a really good one in Twinsburg with some really cool caves that you can walk through as well. I've been through so many and like, you're honestly gonna have to ask my one friend who's not on this podcast who frequently goes on hikes because he actually knows the names of these places. But I agree. Cleveland has some really good ones. Also, Cleveland had a beautiful cherry blossom festival, like you know, a couple, I think a couple of weeks ago, and those were beautiful and full bloom. So Ohio has like a little bit of everything. And that's kind of just the beauty of it is we have pretty much anything you could kind of want to see here. And so we're proud of our home state. People are jealous. That's why they always poke fun at us. <laughs> and uh, how can people learn more about you and your books beyond this interview? The best place I would suggest people to go to is my website, which is hopebollinger.com. Bollinger is B-O-L-I-N-G-E-R. Google always likes to add an extra L in there. All the social media, anything about me, even my modeling portfolio is on there. So anything you could want to know should be on that website. Well, Hope, it was wonderful to get to know you a little bit. Thanks so much for making time and joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much to Hope for the conversation. To learn more about Hope, please check out the link in the podcast description of this episode. At Autism Personal Coach, we provide customized coaching for autistics to help improve the quality of our lives. All of our coaches are either autistic or autistic selected for their commitment to trauma-informed and neurodiversity affirming strategies. They deeply understand burnout, sensory needs, executive functioning, and the importance of special interests. If you're interested in learning more about our coaching, please visit autismpersonalcoach.com for more information. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable and educational experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it would be very much appreciated. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.